Well, the way food studies are reported are sometimes misrepresentative and misleading. Joining us now for what that means to our nutrition is Dr. Yoni Friedhoff, obesity specialist. He's also the author of The Diet Fix, Why Diets Fail and How to Make Yours Work. Welcome back to the agenda. Last time I talked to you, we were talking about your book. Yeah, it's it was a while well. ago. It's Last done summer. okay. I yeah, can't complain. Good job. Okay, I want to talk to you about milk yes. to start off today. I'm going to read some of this from the Ottawa Citizen. It came out uh, just earlier this month. Here's the quote. Kids drink far less milk when schools stop offering chocolate milk, says a Canadian study on the widespread milk debate. Chocolate milk is under attack in schools because it contains sugar. Celebrity chef Jamie Oliver has campaigned against it for years, saying it promotes obesity. When some Saskatchewan elementary schools stopped serving chocolate milk along with the plain kind, the intake of milk fell by 41%, the new study finds. As a result, students were missing important nutrients that they were unlikely to get from the rest of their diet. Okay, that's from the Ottawa Citizen. Dr. Friedhoff outlined the problems uh, that you found with this story. I'm sure it can be applied to many other stories. Yeah, this yeah. story, though, was really quite remarkable. So the the story in the citizen definitely covered what the press release about this study said it said virtually all of those things but if you read the study itself suddenly there's a very different picture that's told in fact it's a picture that proponents of removing chocolate milk from the school might want to latch onto. what the study actually showed was that kids who drank chocolate milk and then no longer had the opportunity to drink chocolate milk half of them immediately switched over to the white stuff and they drank pretty much as much white milk as they did chocolate. 12 milliliters less is what they found. What it showed was that of the kids who after chocolate milk was removed were still drinking milk, it was a 466% increase of white milk consumption compared to prior. And that's just in the first month. This was just a one month study. But the part that really gets to me, really, really gets to me, is that if you continue to read the study, they tried to determine, the researchers tried to determine, does chocolate milk in schools affect total daily milk consumption, total daily dairy consumption? And? and no. So when they removed the chocolate milk from the schools, when they looked at total dairy consumption in those same kids, and they looked at total milk consumption in those same kids, there was no statistical difference in the amount they were consuming. And maybe it's because the amount of milk kids are drinking in school, according to the researchers, is only responsible for 13 to 15 percent of the kids' dairy in a day. Uh, who funded this, this study that's being quoted? So this was a Dairy Farmers of Canada funded study and many of the studies on dairy, go figure, are funded by the people whose vested interest is ensuring people consume more dairy. And I actually spoke with the lead researcher of this study as well on telephone. And he still was trying to make the case, no, look, the milk consumption goes down. The only thing that goes down is in-school milk consumption of prior chocolate milk drinkers. That's what goes down. But again, in the first month, half of the chocolate milk drinkers switched to white milk. And so now we're only talking about half of the milk drinkers, but the total daily consumption didn't change at all. What did change, though, for all of those kids is the amounts of sugar they were consuming and the incredible number of calories they were consuming because certain brands of chocolate milk have double the calories and 20% more sugar than Coca-Cola. I heard something this morning. I just want to talk about it for a quick sec. Milk, I never knew this. The, the like less percentage milk has more sugar in it. So you th I thought skim milk had less sugar. Do am I the only person who didn't know no, this? No, I, I think a lot of people think that that's true. Milk's a very strange thing, right? So here's a product that we have determined as a society seems that it is so nutritionally important that if our kids don't want to drink it, it is okay to shove it full of sugar and ram it down their throats. Kids aren't gonna not choose chocolate milk. Looking at the number of kids consuming milk in school, the vast, vast, vast majority do choose the chocolate stuff. Go figure, if you're given the choice and you're a kid, that's or what you're gonna adult. choose. But you know, we know, for instance, that eating a lot of fruits and berries is good for your health. I mean, there's good data on that. But we don't tell our kids who aren't eating enough berries or apples to have apple pie instead. I mean, that is what we're doing. Chocolate milk is the apple pie of the milk world. It's crazy to me we give it out in schools. Okay, Dr. Friedhoff, let's just, you know, put this in a bit of context. How unusual do you think it is for a reputable news organization to rely so heavily on uh, industry-funded press releases? Well, so we don't know exactly what the reliance was. Perhaps they contacted the author of the study, who in turn might have reported it just like the press release did. We just don't know. 
All I know is that when you do read these studies, oftentimes you can see conclusions that are either wholly different from the press releases or certainly far less exciting than the press release led the public and the reporters to believe. Okay, I also want to just say on behalf of, of journalists, we do try and get beyond the press release and, and find out um, the information. We often go to experts on these kinds of things, on a food store, we'll go to some dairy expert or something. You got thoughts on that too? Well, sometimes it's important to find out who pays the experts. So, for instance, if you've got a lab where the funding of that lab comes from the industry whose product is in question in the study, you've got to figure that there's some influence there, conscious or unconscious. Doesn't mean that everybody who gets uh, funding from industry is somehow doing something horribly wrong and unethical. It's just that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to remove that influence. But sometimes it is more direct than that, where it is someone who is on the payroll. It's not just about funding for a study anymore. It's someone whose actual livelihood comes directly from the industry, where, for instance, a story on milk, they would interview a dietitian who works for the dairy farmers of Canada. They have a very specific message to put forward. And it's not just about dairy. There's a gentleman, he's a cardiologist. He gets a retainer from the Corn Refiners Association of $41,000 a month. That's a ridiculous amount of money. And yet when he's quoted in newspaper stories about high fructose corn syrup, which he defends quite a lot of, He's not reported as the ridiculously well-paid consultant for the corn refiners. He's reported as cardiologist Dr. Such and Such. I mean, I, I guess the, the question is, should he be? I mean, I don't know if he, in this example, didn't disclose or the news uh, place where he was on chose not to disclose, which would seem odd to me, but in any case. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's probably both, both happens. I bet you there are times when the expert doesn't disclose, and I bet you there's times when the news organization decides, you know what, the story sounds better if we don't say that part. Okay. I'm not going there, but okay. <laughs> All right. I want to get back to, to, to milk. Uh, and the Canada Food Guide, which in itself I know is very controversial. We've talked about it before. But... Uh, the Canada Food Guide recommends that children get between two and four servings of milk and alternatives, how it's written a day, um, which is why a story about changing milk consumption is it, it, it's sort of a, a alarming. I have three very young children. This is the debate that goes on in my family, mostly between my mother and I, about how much milk my young children should drink. Is it necessary for children to drink two to four servings of milk per day? So very young children, children under the age of two or three years old, while they're still having brain development, they need the fat from milk. It helps with brain development. Beyond that, it becomes a much less clear statement. And the fact of the matter is, studies looking at the impact of milk consumption on all the things milk is supposed to be good for, especially osteoporosis, it doesn't seem to demonstrate any real impact over time. The longest you know, epidemiologic studies, the nurses' health professional study, the health professionals' follow-up study, these studies fail to demonstrate protective effects of milk consumption on hip fractures, for instance. Now, basically, we've got a wealth of evidence that says, you know what, there probably isn't much, if any, benefit. There probably isn't much, if any, risk, which leaves milk as a protein source with calcium, a liquid protein source, though. And that's problematic because liquid calories aren't compensated for well by people. You have a glass of milk with your meal, you're likely to eat just as much of your meal as you would if you had a glass of water. Mm -hmm. And so in this environment now, where we do struggle quite a lot with weight and diet relatable and weight related chronic diseases, including in our kids, we have gotta ask ourselves whether giving kids lots of calories to drink on a daily basis where there is not a wealth of evidence suggesting there's incredible benefit to it, where we know, for instance, you remove it from the school, you're only going to have these kids drinking 13 to 15 percent less milk in a day because that's what the research has found. I wonder if we're doing the right thing or if we are just stuck in, you know, decades worth of marketing that has taught us all that milk is supposed to be magical. Well, well let me ask you about that because milk seems to be, um, I mean, Food is our obsession, and we like to talk about it and debate it, and there, there's lots, lots of opposing research on it. But milk seems to play this very prominent role in the North American diet, and we debate it all the time. Why is that? Well, so there's huge amounts of money being spent on the marketing of milk. They are huge industries. In Canada, the last time I checked, it was a $20 billion industry for Canada. That's a big industry. 
and it's got big pockets, mm. it's got big reach, not just on marketing, but also politically. You know, the politics of creating Canada's Food Guide is enormous. I remember our dietitian at the time of the last consultation for Canada's Food Guide, she went to a, a consultative meeting and she was sitting with some people from dairy and some people from milk alternatives and there was an argument about the angle of the milk on the picture of the Canada's Food Guide, it was the wrong angle. It made it look less important than mm. the milk people thought it should. And so again, there's huge influence. And then on the Food Guide, in the creation of the Food Guide, on the 12-member advisory panel was someone who was the nutrition manager for the BC Dairy Federation, whose mandate at the time was to increase milk consumption. I guess we don't want to look at milk that way because it's so wholesome. It's supposed to be good for you and not nefarious or anything like and that. And I think that's just a marketing message. Honest to goodness, I really do. I think that's just what we've been taught for so long that we've internalized that as a truth. And the evidence says, no, it's not a truth. Listen, milk is not the devil's brew either. And I don't think it's dangerous beyond its calories. I don't think it's beneficial particularly either. And you can eat dairy foods and get some filling effect as well if we're talking again about weight and the impact that's having on our society, including in our children. You know, drinking our calories probably isn't the best plan. Always a pleasure, Dr. Frieda. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.